Taliban are living probably in the 90s still. They have to sit with the Afghan people, they have to sit with the Afghan government if they want to reach peace with this. I mean, how long more this can continue? I think if there is only one, one red line, and that is the woman's right. Not only is there a seemingly unending war in Afghanistan, there's also extremely bad blood between the Afghan government and the Americans, who are supposed to be on the same side. My guest this week is Nasir Andisha, Afghanistan's ambassador to Switzerland and to the United Nations here in Geneva. How did his government's relations with Washington sink so low? And who's to blame? Nasser Andisha, welcome to Conflict Zone. Uh, not, a, not a stranger to Conflict Zone, but you're welcome. You've uh, had presidential elections again. Uh, once again, there have been allegations of widespread fraud. Who can have confidence in the results of these elections when, they, when the results come? Um, yes, you know, we had an election despite uh, intimidations, despite all of the threats which was posed by Taliban, and also a lot of naysayers. So, I'm talking uh, about fraud. Uh, so I'm, I'm just you know, coming to this, but, but having an election and the situation in Afghanistan shows the resolve of the Afghan people to decide their fate democratically. But the question of you know, irregularities in the elections, uh, which has been in the past also in Afghanistan, unfortunately, uh, so far the reports that I have received is that, that it has been uh, a much, a much uh, a better election than before. So who accepts the results? Really? Uh, we who, have who, seen, who says that? I, mean, uh, I think all, if you look at the, all the uh, independent observers of this election, they are telling us, giving you know, the, the, the new regulation, the mechanisms, the biometric uh, devices, this election has been uh, which much better. Which weren't working in many places. So, and and even when they were yeah. working, they weren't followed. They so weren't used. That is, that's the technical technical issues we are talking about. It's not about. just the technical issue. It's reluctance of people to use them. So you see, it's, it's just it's a learning learning process. But but coming to the results of the election, it's both can I mean all the candidates, but including the both front runners, uh, have been very categorically clear that they will accept the result of this election. Uh, announced by the independent uh, uh, election commission. Well, that of would Afghanistan. make a change, wouldn't it? That would make a change if they accepted the results, because there was, there was a lot of negotiation that had to take place in 2014, which was also marred by massive fraud, as were last year's parliamentary elections as well. So you don't you don't have a good record here. The system is is completely rotten, isn't it? Uh, you see, it's uh, as I said, you know, it's, it's a learning process. My yardsticks and the yardsticks of many observers in Afghanistan should be that are we doing better than the past or it's getting worse? So I will say this election is much better than the previous election. I mean, look at look, the case last, of Afghanistan. Last month, Ambassador, last month we had the former heads of the Election Commission and the Electoral Complaints Commission both jailed for fraud along with eight members of their staff. How many other people are involved in fraud right up in the, the country? How many? So you, you see that also again shows the resolve of the state that that you know the election fraud will not will not go easy with it. So I think that's that's part of building a strong institutions. But if you look at the case of this Afghanistan, was only, this was only the tip of the iceberg. This so, was the tip of the so iceberg. So we, we are addressing the tip of it, and then we'll get to the bottom of it too. The New York Times reported that in Kesar district in Faryab province, one of the elders told them that local strongmen had been stuffing the ballot boxes. They sat together and each filled the boxes for their guy, they said. We can't leave these boxes empty. We said, but what about the biometric verification? They said, who's going to look? It's that kind of attitude, isn't it? A scene that has doubtless been multiplied many, many times across the country, many times. Uh, you see, Tim, you know, in Afghanistan now it's uh, 16 years that we are doing elections. In Switzerland it's 160 years where, you know, where we have this interview. And I asked the Swiss that, you know, how they How many progressed. years does it take to be honest? You see, it, it depends on you know how you build institutions and you build the trust within the institutions. The the case that you have mentioned, of course, is a report by New York Times. I don't have the the verification of it, but even if that is accurate, it shows that you know people do they still trust the institution and who 
can make the institutions trustable is the, is the central state, you know, the government in Kabul. And that's why, you know, they put those, those commissioners into the trial. We have introduced the most, you know, uh, advanced system of uh, uh, yeah, elections. Which, 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 people, just, which people aren't using. It, look, Ambassador, in another district, in Nangarhar, no less a person than the Speaker of the Senate, an Afghani loyalist, issued a direct threat to the Chief of the Election Commission on television after she said only the biometrically checked votes would be counted. His response on television was, we will force even her daddy to count the non-biometric votes. Great to see how powerful people are just tearing up the rules and making them as they go along. And, 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 a and powerful person no, like that yes, has no, no interest is, in obeying the rules. He is, but, but subsequently he apologized, and he apologized to the head of the election commission. And again, it shows a change in a country like Afghanistan, where a powerful person like the president of the Senate apologizes to a woman who is the head of the uh, election commission of Afghanistan. And I think that shows a change of attitude. I'm not saying that, you know, it's perfect. We are moving. We are you, moving take, you, take, you take that as progress, do you? I do. You know, as a person who lives in Afghanistan and I've seen, you know... You're uh, clutching at straws, aren't you? You see, when you're in our situation, you do that. Your president said the election was needed to give the new president a powerful mandate. But there is no powerful mandate to be had in Afghanistan, is there? Certainly not by elections. Fact is that power, real power in your country, is not through democratic means, but by a feuding, fractious collection of strongmen, warlords, corrupt officials, and they don't have much use for democracy, do they? Wasn't that the case in the Europe in the past? I mean, how, did, was well, there... How many centuries do you want to go back? We're, we're, we're living in, in 2019. I think that's the difference between Europe and, and our country. So we are moving in that direction. And you that proud of murder, torture, forced disappearances, intimidation, this kind of thing that goes on in your country, and you compare it to Europe? No, not, no of, course, of course not. What I'm saying is that, look, you know, by the time that Europe progressed in this path, there was no uh, conflict zone or hot talk or somebody to make them you know, accountable. So they were moving on their own pace. But what we do is we don't want to move on that pace. We don't have that time. But we need, you know, the perseverance, we need the assistance, we need, you know, the good models and modalities and technology to help this country move along this, maybe quicker, faster, but it might not happen in, 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 in 16 years. But in some ways you're moving backwards, Ambassador. I mean, you take the media, which blossomed for a while after the Taliban were overthrown. A hundred media outlets have been forced to close, as Human Rights put it, Human Rights Watch put it, threats and abuse by government officials, warlords and security forces, together with devastating attacks by groups tied to the Islamic State, the Taliban, other insurgents, all this have forced more than a hundred media outlets to close. What an enormous step backwards, isn't it? So, yeah, it uh, basically is, is it, is it a, a systematic? Is it a government policy that, you know, we're clamping down on media? No, you know, it's the... No, but you're not clamping down on the warlords either. No, we do. Really? You know, we, we are in a fight, we are in a war. We are clamping down on the international terrorists, which is the enemy of all of the world. But at the same time, we are trying to reform our institution where we can reduce the power of these strong people. The people so, that I mean, you've had in power, mm -hmm. President Ghani, Abdullah Abdullah, chief executive, what have they done? They've, they've completely set up a structure which is by, beset by divisions, internal disagreements, discords. Crisis group said, Political partisanship has permeated every level of the security apparatus, undermining the command structures of the Afghan National Defense and Security Forces. So far from unifying the country, these two figures have actually divided it even further for the benefit of their personal ambitions, haven't they? You see, it depends on which angle you're looking at it. Probably crisis group at reality. Is, no, no, crisis group will look at it from the very, very sort of perfectionist angle. Yes, you know, we, we have experiences of the they're countries called the which... national government, no, the, government the, national the, unity. The, they're doing the opposite. So just give me an example of other national unity government which has, you know, completed their terms. The state has not fallen. We can down. play what about games forever. No, We're no. looking at Afghanistan. No, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, we have... But then you have to put it in perspective. We, we had Libya, you know, going for this kind of election. A divisive election was there. We have two governments there. We have Syria, which was, you know, the You're worst not case. Ambassador Yemen, for Libya or Syria. Yemen, We're talking about Afghanistan. So 
you know, taking, talking in Afghanistan in isolation will not help because you have to look at it to see how we are looking at this situation. We are looking at a situation in Afghanistan that is the states and institutions way gathered. Of deflecting attention from what's going on in your country, but it doesn't help to look at Syria no, and but Libya. What I'm saying is you're that not responsible for Syria and but, Libya. But crisis group also have a yardstick, which is you know they they have they have you know measures that okay this government this country is better better doing better than the other country. So that's why I'm comparing it. Yes, our national unity government had its own problems. The two rival teams with the two different you know uh, way of thinking about governance. One about a little bit you know decentralized, other about a centralized government. They came together actually to to keep the state together and, and prevent the complete... The state you know, is together when you're having shootouts between government forces and, and warlords who are supposed to be on the same side? But at the same time, you know, we were fighting an insurgency. Yeah, but it, even if there wasn't an insurgency, you'd still be at war with your own people. You see, as I said, that, you know, it depends. We, we are, you know... All we these are years as, fighting the Taliban, you're mm -hmm. still having shootouts with your own people. I mean... In, in a situation like Afghanistan, you know, what, what, what do you expect? You know, what we say that, you know, the Americans will say that, you know, we chew gum and walk. You know, we fight terrorists of many, many uh, 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 divisions. We have ISIS there, we have Taliban, you know, a county network. But at the same time, also, we have people who wanted to keep the, the government weak. So, you know, we are The we are government is different. weak, isn't it? The government is weak, so it's, and it's, it fails mm -hmm. to take measures against prominent people mm -hmm. who they could make an example of. Let's take the case of the former governor of Panjshir province, Keramuddin Karim. Mm -hmm. An arrest warrant was issued for him in the summer after multiple allegations that he sexually assaulted women when he was a president of the country's football federation. Why hasn't he been arrested and formally charged? So he was he's charged. Weeks have, he's, he's, weeks no, have he's gone charged. by. Why hasn't he been arrested? He was removed from his position. His case is now in the Attorney General's office. It, probably he's not in the country. I mean, in, we have many cases where even the international community has not helped us. The suggestion from Human Rights Watch is that he continues to wield considerable influence among the police and other politicians, and that's why he got off. That's why he's I, been... I, I don't think so. He maybe hasn't that, been arrested. Maybe in the past, even if you don't has... arrest him, you could have seized his property, couldn't you? I think that's Attorney General's case. I, I, I don't have that details, but I can assure you that, that no, he does not wield any, any power right now in Kabul. The Americans have criticized your inaction in the strongest possible terms. The ambassador, John Bass, said in June, we call on the government of Afghanistan to complete its investigation and ensure justice is served. So part of that investigation... Why did you do that? Uh, Tim, part of that investigation, we send even a team here to, to meet FIFA. They went to Germany. They FIFA to has fined this gentleman so a, million, a million dollars. But, but you know, putting they the case... They took action. Yes. They, you haven't. A case, it's, cannot, it's not like, you know, you, you, you collect... You know, you have to collect evidence. It has to be strong because it's an international case right now. There are international lawyers in this. We cannot, you know, have an abrupt justice in this case where later on some other courts will come against it. So we take all the, you know, the, the, the due diligence. We send delegations of our attorneys in these countries to interview. You're supposed to do that before interview. you issue an arrest warrant. You've issued an arrest warrant, now pick him up. This so, is what the Americans are saying. You say, you say, I'll give an example. You know how long it'll take for those attorneys to get a visa for these Western countries? You We're not talking I, about this. I'm talking about this football. I don't, I'm talking the same thing. Of the I'm talking about the same case. Of Afghanistan, who you're leaving yeah, I'm talking about the same case because part you of this case You have a real problem was, with the rule of law, don't you? A real problem exercising mm -hmm. the rule of law. You see, yes, you know, we have problem with rule of law, but, but exercise of rule of law requires a strong state, and that is what we have to build. You also have a big problem with torture, and that is perhaps the worst aspect of your government's failure on the human rights front, hasn't it? Torture by your security services and their affiliates. Time and again, Western agencies have reported the appalling treatment inflicted by your officials and local allies on prisoners. Why do you so consistently fail to crack down on these disgraceful practices? Can, 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 you, can you give me statistics on this? Because what I, as, as far as I'm here, in the past six months, you know, our records on this, because we have recently joined the uh, optional protocol of CAT, which is Convention Against Torture, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so which allows even the cases to be taken to any courts, and it allows for the investigators to get into even our prisons. I think that is the most open part of this convention. 
And, and but, Unama's report, I remember you, Unama yeah, people I'm here. I'm talking about Unama's latest report, which said Unama's about latest report said that there is a reduction, there is a substantial reduction in the cases of this, especially, you know, in, in areas which was in, you know, in India, But you in still Kandahar. have a third of conflict-related detainees alleging serious abuse, including severe beatings, mm -hmm. electric shocks, near suffocation, and suspension from the ceiling for long periods. Mm -hmm. And that's from Yanama's latest report. So what, what does all this say? What does it say about you, that you, these practices continue year after year after year when they're flagged up mm -hmm. year after year? No, but, but what I'm Why saying is... Why don't you is, crack no, down on them? We, we do. We definitely really? do. Look, look, How look many at, people have been charged at, for look torture? At, look, look at those statistics of Yanama, which will tell you there is 27 person reduction in the cases, which is alleged torture. And Not alleged. in Kandahar. Yes, in Kandahar, no. including in Kandahar. The latest report the, called the numbers mm -hmm. tortured in Kandahar staggering, staggering, mm -hmm. it said. This in facilities under the control of the main intelligence agency, mm -hmm. the National Directorate of Security. Do you, do your, does your government actually control this agency? Of course we do. Of then why do you do. allow this of torture? Staggering levels of torture in the latest UNAMA report. Why do you, you allow see, no, it? The, this, the question should not be put like this, that we are allowing it. It's not like it's the government. We're not doing anything to stop no, it. We are doing everything possible. Kandahar was possible. flagged up mm -hmm. as a major torture center every year for at least eight years. What did you do with the reports? But, but how put is it in the, the bin? No, no, but how is the progress? You just go deep into that report. It they tells call it you. Staggering. It tells you between. Okay, you know, it's staggering. Sometimes we understand the semantics. You know, the way you put these words. But but the discussion I had here with the Unama Human Rights People in this office, they told me that there is a substantial improvement in this case, especially in Kandahar. They spoke with the uh, commander of police of Kandahar, and they assured them of every possible cooperation. Who's been held to ICS. account? Here's the test. Who's been held to account? As for accountability, we've only seen minor disciplinary sanctions in the very few cases that were investigated, and no compensation for victims, despite a legal requirement in your country to provide that. Why? Why? Uh, uh, Why nobody held accountable? Why no compensation? No, they, are, they are held accountable. How many? Huh? How many? So in the case of uh, the past UNAMA reports, there have been people from the Indies in Kandahar, from the How police many? departments. How many? So I can give you the statistics. So, so, Maybe so, so why do they continue to torture then? No, it's, I think it's, it's, it's reducing. And if they you look get off scot-free. That's the fact that you're not telling you say, me, isn't you know, it? We, uh, we, are, we have the most uh, you know, open and voluntary pledges vis-a-vis -vis all the United Nations uh, mechanisms of human rights. You know, the, the, the protocols, the optional protocols, the conventions, and the treaty bodies. So it's, it's like, you know, Afghanistan have pledged that, look, we have a very open and transparent system of human rights. Yes, there might be, you know, it's not our commitment. Maybe there might, there be. might be. No, there might be capacity problems. There might be problems which is, you know, the, 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 uh, the uh, local, somewhere a local police is, con uh, you know, conducting maybe this, uh, some of these crimes. But it's not lack of it's government It's happening in your main intelligence directorate. We're not talking about local police. Just a few days ago, you tweeted that the Afghan government is fighting a complex, unconventional and asymmetrical war with enemies that don't adhere to international humanitarian law. You omitted to point out that your government doesn't adhere to international humanitarian law either. Why? No. no. In contrary, I said we commit to every bit of IHL while our enemy you does not. You may commit to it on paper, but get no. into your prisons, you won't see much uh, sign no, of international no, no, humanitarian no, law, will no, you? Not at all. I mean, you can ask, you can ask human rights uh, uh, officers, you can ask UNAMA and see, you know, how they can... Well, we've, just been, state, into, we've, we've just been into... The problem, state, problem is that you're cool. supposed mm -hmm. to be the good side. Of course we are. In this. Of course we are. And you're abusing, torturing, murdering, stealing, no, disappearing no, 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 no. people. And the international community, mostly the US, mm -hmm. has lost some 2,500 soldiers mm -hmm. to protect a government that allows this to go on. Do you think no, that's we, right? We lost 150,000 soldiers. And I this understand. war, you see, I understand. I think you, can, you can put it in the broader perspective. I'm and just, why, why the war is happening there? I mean, you're coming to, 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 to a details where you know, it can deviate public opinion. So if you look at from the larger perspective, why United States and Afghanistan, why we are fighting, whom we are fighting with. I mean, we are fighting with an enemy which wanted to use each and every possible mean to inflict pain on the civilians. I mean, the lost casualties of 100 ordinary people in a wedding hall. I mean, what can justify that?
I, a real I'm, fight I'm, in that I'm kind of I'm not trying to justify any of the violence. I'm trying to justify the things which the Americans particularly have pointed out, mm -hmm. like corruption, where they claim you are not doing enough. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't help that your president's national security advisor, Hamidullah Mohib, picked a fight with the U.S. in March, accusing their peace negotiator, Mr. Khalil Zad, of acting out of personal ambition and seeking to become viceroy in a caretaker government. Was that really such a good idea, to pick a fight with America? You see, no. They're fighting no, for you. No, no, the thing is that we're not, we not fighting with the United States. I mean, that's, that's, that's very well understandable. The question is that there, break, there, there is supposed to be a peace. You have a breakdown in relations. They've rescinded $160 million because they don't think you're a partner who's mm -hmm. fighting corruption. $160 million they've taken back. No, they're not taking back. They withhold this from some of exactly. the projects. Exactly. And that's, and that's uh, again, that's a very technical thing. But Secretary but, of State Mike Pompeo mm -hmm. accused your government of being unable to manage transparently mm -hmm. U.S. government resources and incapable of being a partner. That's a pretty stinging rebuke, isn't it? You, you see, there we are together. There is a framework called mutual accountability. I mean, the government of Afghanistan is ready and it's open. If there are problems, those are shared problems. So if they are progress, that's a shared progress. But coming to the relationship with the United States, the question is there is a peace process. And we all understand that the peace process has at least two sides. And one side is the state and the government of Afghanistan. So we are saying that without the state of government of Afghanistan, any peace process which will go in you know, one-sided is doomed to failure. So you feel excluded? You're excluded? No, we are included right They're now. They're negotiating because, over your head. Is because, that right? Because you see, the negotiation has two parts. So one is The Taliban won't where, sit down with you. The Taliban oh, won't they have sit to down sit. with you. They have to sit. But well, you they can go on sit. saying they have to, but they've said they won't. The thing is, we are, we are reality on the ground. The Taliban are living probably in the 90s still. I mean, this is a different thing. They have to sit with the Afghan people. They have to sit with the Afghan government if they want to reach peace with this. But you're not capable of negotiating peace deals with your own strongmen and warlords, let mm -hmm. alone the Taliban, are you? No, that's why we have election. That's why we have election. As if that solves anything. Oh, it will. Last month, both the US and the Taliban appeared close to an agreement. And then Trump called off a meeting at, uh, at Camp David. You don't want those talks to succeed, do you? Uh, they've started again in Sweden. I understand there have been new talks that have been taking no, place No, we there. definitely want that to succeed because, you know, one thing we all understand that, that we're all sick and tired of war. I mean, this war is 18 years, but I myself, I epitomize a generation of war. I was born in 1979, just before the Soviet invaded Afghanistan. I mean, how long more this can continue? We all want peace. But peace has to be sustainable peace. It's not sustainable until unless all the stakeholders are not coming together and agreeing on a common vision for future of Afghanistan. Taliban cannot force their way into Kabul and cannot, you know, have their draconian ideology and, and rule of the past. They also understand. I mean, I've been involved in some of this peace process uh, uh, negotiation in Moscow. So you're talking Adams. about Taliban light now, are you? you see, they've, they've shown no sign that they're changing whatsoever. I mean, they have to change. In peace, you know... In Again, a, you say they have to. Yes. They have to. Yes. But there's no sign that they will. They I know. I have seen change. As, as far as they're concerned, they don't have to at do least, anything. At least, at least in level of rhetoric. The, the discussions that we have, we have seen that there is an understanding for the Taliban that they cannot have it all the way they want it. I mean, do you accept, do you accept, Ambassador, that at some point, if this war is to end, you'll have to enter a power-sharing agreement with the Taliban? Do you accept that? You see, how do you call it a power-sharing? I'll say that, you know, the state the Taliban can be part of the state institutions. But will it be through a power sharing? Will it be through an election? Will it be through you know, any other mechanism? I think that's open for inter Afghan negotiations. But they become part of the governing elite of as, as part of, you know, if it is, if it is as part of as an agreement, as part of an inter Afghan negotiation, yes. The same Taliban that continues killing your people, your civilians, blowing up your most valuable religious, cultural sites, Taliban that would has punished women by whipping them and refusing to let them go to school or work with men. You really think that's changing? I mean, really? if, if they agree with a common vision of future of Afghanistan, well, which they is don't, based... Well, they do they? They're, they're saying they, they want well. an Islamic version. 
You say we already have an Islamic mm -hmm. government. Mm -hmm. You differ very much yes, on yeah. what that actually mm -hmm. means, don't you? You see, the sides are very yeah. far apart. Yeah. Here. A negotiation is they have their, you know, their stated position. We have our own stated position, but but we, you know, as diplomats, we expect and we believe that there is a zone of agreement where the two sides will come to a consensus, and that consensus will not be something that they definitely want, and that will not be something that everything that we want. So that's, that's what the definition of a negotiation is. If we reach into a negotiated agreement with the Taliban where you know, the overarching gains that we had you know, in terms of human rights, in terms of you know, constitutionalism, a governance for They'd the people. They'd roll them back. They would roll them back. No, then, then You've had four million girls in school. Then, four then million it would, girls no, in school. Of course, that's not something that who, we will who compromise. Couldn't, who couldn't? No. Who couldn't go to school not. I mean, when the, the women Taliban rights, were in charge? Women's rights is a red line. I think if there is only one, one red line, and that is the woman's right. The woman has their rights, they are gained it themselves, they have fought for it in the past 18 years, even in the past, and this is not something that neither I and neither you or international community should compromise. Ambassador, thank you very much for being on the Thank you.